Hello and good afternoon. Thank you very much for tuning in. The topic I'd like to discuss today is mud flood and evidence of it in Cincinnati, Ohio. And if you're just tuning in to my channel for the first time and you've never seen my videos before, you might want to go check out another video first, which is Philip Drujinin, The Biggest Conspiracy in History, where he talks about this concept of mud flood. And then if you watch this video first, my videos are going to make a lot more sense. Okay, so just to give you an introduction to Cincinnati, I'll read this description here from Google. Cincinnati is a city in Ohio on the Ohio River. The Over the Rhine District is known for its 19th century architecture including Findlay Market which has food and craft vendors. To the north is Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. The Cincinnati Museum Center encompasses world history, science, and children's museums in the Art Deco Union Terminal. Works spanning 6,000 years are on display in the Cincinnati Art Museum. I got distracted there. Somebody at the door. Okay, well, to start things off, here's a good image of uh, a flooded structure in Cincinnati on the Ohio River. And I don't know much more about it. And what I'd like to try and cover as well is that Cincinnati had a tradition of these river boats, steamships, paddle boats, and even up until the last 10 years, uh, Cincinnati has had a continued tradition of having these paddle boat festivals in its city. So it's known for that. And it's also a popular tourist, attra tourist attraction and you can book a tour up and down the Ohio. Okay, so before getting into the content of my Cincinnati, Ohio mud flood video, I'd just like to make a follow-up comment to a previous video I had made. You'll see a, a video on my channel called you know, Lions and Their Symbolism. I forget the title I gave it. But anyway, I talked at length in a 40-minute video about lion gargoyles and lion statues in architecture. And I just wanted to include this in my video because when I turned my computer on today, uh, this current version of Windows presents sort of a screenshot on your on your computer as it's loading up and booting up and I just like to say that this image showed up on my computer screen you might be familiar with these as well it seems to be uh, kind of the new format for for Windows and you know if you want to talk about synchronicity uh, this is it because here you have a lion with its hand on this ball structure and well, it, it kind of blew my mind when I saw it, so it's very synchronous. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so I'd like to start off just to give you an idea of where Cincinnati is. So here's a map of the United States. You've got the Great Lakes. I live up in this area. And anyway, here's New York, Philadelphia, Florida's down here. Okay, and I'm going to start things off in Pittsburgh because in Pittsburgh you have two tributary rivers. One is the Allegheny and the other one's the Monongahela River, which people call the Mon. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that all correctly. And it flows down here all the way over, eventually leading up to, I'll zoom out, leading to Cincinnati. zoom out over here 
So here's a zoomed in shot of Cincinnati, which I guess is this red area on the map. And you have the Ohio River flowing through. And this river creates a border state boundary between Kentucky and Ohio. And here is kind of where you see the iconic photography of Cincinnati itself. So if you see a lot of cityscape photography of Cincinnati, it's probably from this scene. And a lot of it seems to be taken from the Covington, Kentucky side looking towards Cincinnati. So just zoom out just to show you where we are. So here's Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, so bear with me. I'd like to just read this into the video. Tall Stacks. Tall Stacks, formerly known as the Tall Stacks Music, Arts, and Heritage Festival, was a festival held every three or four years in the Cincinnati, Ohio area, which celebrated the city's heritage of the riverboat. The sixth and, to date, final edition was held on October 4th through October 8th, 2006. So to add my own input, this is a festival that no longer takes place. The festival typically featured a number of vintage and replica steamboats from across the eastern United States, which docked along the Ohio River shoreline in Cincinnati and across the river in Covington and Newport, Kentucky. And I'm just going to look at some of these images because they're great pictures. I forgot to read the video cap or the picture caption. With that, that one said, "The Bell of Louisville, Louisville, Natchez, and Majestic preparing for 2006 Tall Stacks." So this was, I guess, in preparation for the festival. And in the background, you see the baseball stadium for the Cincinnati Reds. And here's some some more shots. Bell of Louisville. And that caption said, The Bell of Louisville docks next to the Natchez in Cincinnati or Tall Stacks. And here's another, another image. And they're beautiful. I can see why people would come and take their time to show up at this festival. Okay, so here at home, I have a few coffee table reader size books and I bought them over the years and I did that because they were pretty cheap at the bookstore I think I paid maybe ten twelve dollars for each of the books kind of in the discount section but they had some good content for my video so this is David Ross's ships visual encyclopedia the inside of the book looks very much like the outside of the cover and another book I scan this on my scanner is Great American Cities Past and Present? Um, I got there. Oh, here's the other cover. And this book is by Rick Sapp and Brian Solomon. Now, I don't want to confuse you because what you see on the cover of this book is not actually Cincinnati. This is actually a picture of Brooklyn, New York, and what you're looking at is the Brooklyn Bridge. And here you can see a past image and a present day image. Now, you might get this confused with Cincinnati because Cincinnati has a very similar style bridge connecting Cincinnati to Covington, Kentucky. Now, if you look into the history of the Brooklyn Bridge and the Cincinnati Bridge, which I'll show you in a moment, you'll find that they give both bridges the credit to an engineer named John A. Roebling. So this this is called the Brooklyn Bridge. And I better fact check this, but okay, I'm gonna uh, I'll, I'll move forward here. So let's go go forward with the images. So this is inside this particular book. I just went to the Cincinnati section and here you have a pan panoramic set of images 
of Cincinnati in the year 1866. Now one of the problems I have with this book is that a lot of these panoramic images are reprinted in a very small format in the book. So it's her very hard to get the finer detail. This is not a big problem because we can actually look for these images on Google and we can find better better images. But I'll try and zoom in. So here we have Cincinnati in the year 1866. So as related to mud flood, notice how like the bank of the river is covered in mud. There's not a lot of foliage, there's no trees, there's no bushes. This looks like dirt. And almost like some of the images you can find on old European cities and into like St. Petersburg, Russia and Moscow, there's a strange phenomenon in a lot of the old photographic pictures from the 1860s of these old cities that you don't see a lot of people in them and there's no signs of life happening. Here's an image of the John Roebling suspension bridge and it's very brief in the book so I'm just going to read it into the video. It's saying the suspension bridge. John A. Roebling suspension bridge connected Cincinnati with Covington, Kentucky. It was completed in 1866 before his better known Brooklyn Bridge. Right? And it says in the book talking about these paddle boat steamers paddle steamers. Few paddle steamers remain in existence today, but from the start of the 19th century, they were essential river transports. Cincinnati is the location of the Tall Stacks Festival that celebrates river boats on the Ohio. Not a whole lot of trees either. What caught my attention is how these paddle steamers are moored along the bank of the river. Like there's usually a dock or even like a what they call them like a pier. Don't seem to be Okay, this is also contained in the book by Rick Sapp and Brian Solomon, so all credit goes to them. I'm going to put a fair use disclaimer in this, I have to remember to do that. And anyway, here's a here's a picture of one of the paddle steamers. Unfortunately, I'm not the I'm not catching the name of this one. But I find these interesting because here you have like this 19th century detail. Almost looks like it's from antebellum architecture. Now that's something I want to cover in a future video. Antebellum architecture. And you have like these an antenna structures all along the exterior of the building which actually is reminiscent of old architecture as well. A lot of old homes and buildings had these antenna type of details or devices on them. And you also have a uh, similar type of detail on the top of this superstructure, whatever you want to call this. But also I'd like to point out, I'll try to zoom in, you've got these poles with balls on top. Now Conspiracy R Us made out an entire video discussing these and I'll try to leave a link in the description below of that. Now let's get a zoom in shot of these antennas. Again this was taken from a book. So you have, yeah, like these antennas with ball shapes on top. Now I'm not drawing a conclusion. I'm purely speculating and it's my imagination running wild. But part of me wonders whether this is harnessing electricity and maybe you have some type of generator or motor, DC motor, that actually powers the paddle boat which would also make you wonder why they would have these steam stacks on them but that's a different different debate right? here's just a few images from the book I have 
Just to give you some context in, in a timeline, these paddle steamers showed up around the 1830s, apparently, so that's pretty impressive that they had the technology to uh, build these in the 1830s. I'll read it into the video. By the late 1830s, the paddle steamer could cross oceans. Marine engineering became a specialized subject and engines were more reliable, but any long-distance steamer also carried sails, insurance against mechanical breakdown. And this is an interesting feature because on all these old pictures in this book, they add sails to the structure of the ship. Uh, you know, it makes me question whether or not these are the sails were original to these type of ships. I'm just saying that's something I am skeptical about. I, I haven't found evidence for that yet. Oh, well, that's my image again. Okay. Okay, so continuing on with Cincinnati, here you have the John Roebling Suspension Bridge, which was officially completed in 1866, and that's apparently the same engineer that built the Brooklyn Bridge. Got another image. So this is the Brooklyn Bridge here, and it is pretty impressive that supposedly in the 1870s and 1860s they had the technology and uh, heavy equipment to build something like this, not to mention they had the ability to pour a foundation and base within the middle of a river. All back in the 1870s and 1860s. How they did that, I don't know, but I do remember there was on Netflix a series of kind of historical drama dramatization videos which showed the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. So there are kind of uh, explanations for this if you go looking for it. Just to prove it to you, here's the Netflix uh, website and it's got these historical engineering developments and they had um, they had made videos on it so they had a video on the Brooklyn Bridge. Maybe I can find a link for that and leave it in the description below for something you might be able to watch on YouTube. But anyway, getting back to talking about the John A. Roebling Bridge in Cincinnati, I'm just going to read in the Wikipedia article for this. Whoops. The John A. Roebling Suspension Bridge, originally known as the Cincinnati-Covington Bridge, spans the Ohio River between Cincinnati, Ohio and Covington, Kentucky. When opened on December 1, 1866, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world at 1,057 feet. Pedestrians use the bridge to get between the sports venues in Cincinnati, which is Paul Brown Stadium, and Great American Ballpark, and U.S. Bank Arena, and the hotels, bars, restaurants, and parking lots in northern Kentucky. The bar and restaurant district at the foot of the bridge on the Kentucky side is known as Roebling Point. Ramps were constructed leading directly from the bridge to the Dixie Terminal. What's the Dixie Terminal? Let's click on that. I guess this is the Dixie Terminal. Dixie Terminal for building for used for streetcars. These provided Covington Cincinnati streetcars with a grade separated route to the center of downtown and the terminal building was originally intended to connect via underground that's neat underground pedestrian passages with the never built Fountain Square station of the infamous, infamous C Cincinnati subway. I'm gonna open this up because I have to talk about that too. When streetcar service ceased in the 1950s, the terminal was converted into diesel bus terminal. Okay, it's not that interesting. Okay, I'll try to get this shot into the video. Uh, carte to visit, carte to visite, the suspension bridge Cincinnati from a stamp on the back taken from Covington looking towards Cincinnati, 1870. Let's zoom in on that. Now oh, you got some people in the picture. These places do look kind of desolate, desolate, and there's not a lot of trees at this time. Okay, I'll just read this first paragraph. This is relating to the construction of the John A. Roebling 1866 suspension bridge. Excavation from the f for the foundation of the 
Covington Tower commenced in September 1856 and went smoothly. A foundation was set consisting of 13 layers of oak beams, each layer set perpendicular to the one beneath, boiled with iron hardware, and finally all cemented into place. On the Cincinnati side, work was delayed for the start. The construction crews could not pump water out of the excavating pit fast enough. After months of progress, Roebling decided against buying costly machinery or bigger engines for his pumps and, quite last minute, designed his own square positive displacement pumps from 3-inch pine planks. He built them locally in about 48 hours and ran them off, on, off of one of Amos Schinkel's tugboats, the Champion No. 1. The homemade pumps displaced 40 gallons of mud and clay in each cycle. Okay, so now I'm changing the subject and I'm going to be talking about the Cincinnati subway. I'm going to try and read the Wikipedia article into this video, but just briefly what I know about the Cincinnati subway is that it was a subway system that was never completed and there was all these um, tunnels underneath the city of Cincinnati and they never actually got it completely built. So even today there's remnants and remains of this subway system that never got complete. And just quickly I'll read this into the video. The Cincinnati subway is a set of incomplete derelict tunnels and stations for a rapid transit system beneath the streets of Cincinnati, Ohio. Although it is only a little over two miles in length, it is the largest abandoned subway tunnel system in the United, Stra United States. Construction began in the early 1900s as an upgrade to the Cincinnati streetcar system, but was abandoned due to escalating costs. The collapse of funding amidst political bickering and the Great Depression during the 1920s and 1930s period. In 1928, the construction of the subway system in Cincinnati was indefinitely cancelled. There are no plans to revive the project. Okay, so I Google image searched Cincinnati subway, and what I'm really looking for is old historical pictures of Cincinnati. I'm going to try to get some full screens of these. Okay, apparently this is on Vine Street in Cincinnati. Looks like there's a lot of foundational kind of structures or remnants from a previous era that are here once you get digging down underneath. This does not look like fresh, freshly laid bricks. What do I know? I'll zoom out. This comes from the University of Cincinnati Libraries try and leave this as a link in the description below. Okay, I'll read some of this from this ForgottenOhio.com website. Most major cities have subway systems. New York, LA, Chicago, Washington. In the early years of the 20th century, when the river trade was flourishing and it ranked in the top 10 largest cities in the nation, Cincinnati decided, decided to build one for itself. The major impetus was the draining of the Miami and Erie Canal, along with which the subway would be built. It's, just, it's the images that I'm really interested in looking at. Okay, looks pretty mud flooded to me. You know, in the 1880s, did they have the ability to dig with heavy construction equipment the way we do today? So, almost like the Erie Canal or the Pasig River in the Philippines, you know, you've got these meandering rivers that go through the city, trenches even. Uh, Buffalo, New York had a similar type of river or canal that went through the city. So is it something similar that they're digging up? Was this just a flooded canal system that maybe went through the city of Cincinnati? Almost like Venice, although Venice is almost completely flooded. Unfortunately I haven't read all this content and decided what to include in the video looks pretty mud flooded or muddied. Are these buildings being used at this point in time? I suppose these are subway tunnels that maybe were being built 
or excavated. And apparently there's a lot of this going on in the Cincinnati area where these tunnel entrances pop up out of nowhere. Okay, now carrying on to the next feature of Cincinnati that I'd like to talk about. I'd like to talk about the Alms and Depke building in Cincinnati. And before I start reading content into the video, I'm just going to take a look at some of these pictures first, first, just to show you. Okay, so here's a postcard, a colorized postcard. And it's in interesting because a lot of these old postcards that are colorized have this same style to them where they've got in red text they've got the name and place of it you'll see a lot you'll see this a lot for old cities anywhere worldwide but anyway this is the Alms and Depke building and I've actually got to spend a little more time looking into this myself but this here you see uh, a canal going along in front of it and I'm wondering whether or not this is the subway system canal type of thing going through uh, Cincinnati itself. Maybe this has since been covered up. Okay, well, uh, once again, you if you've heard of the mud flood incident, uh, you've watched the other video I mentioned at the beginning of this one, you've got uh, submerged basement or first, four, first story foundational windows kind of inundated with mud and half buried. And the Alms and Depke building is a very good example and even this building over here is even a more egregious example if you like big words but anyway bottom line is something just isn't quite right about these uh, windows at the bottom here here's the same image but not colorized okay this is actually a link I'm gonna leave in the description below it's another YouTube video which covers the history of this building it's from history in your own backyard just I'll play the very intro of it anyway I'm gonna try to cue it up in this video but uh, they begin discussing the history of this building and the German immigrant men who ended up owning it and very very curiously I've I found a missing detail or a strange detail in this story and they don't really know who the original title ho holder to this building is so this is like a dry goods storage building and they'll get talking about it you'll hear it and they really have a problem in the future with this building where they can't really decide conclusively who the title to this property belongs to. The building started out as um, a dry good, interesting building in that it uh, has some cutting edge technology for its time, but this building started out as um, a dry goods merchant. Um, two brothers, Frederick and um, his brother uh, Alms, uh, and along with William uh, Depke, um, they decided that they wanted to do expand their business and by by the 1855 they were very well established as one of the the leading dry goods merchants in the entire area so at that point in time they decided um, they were going to be a little different from the standard um, in front of the building on the south side is the um, where the Miami Erie Canal used to be 
from uh, Hannaford and Proctor, a very, very prominent architectural firm here. It's just designed in uh, 1868. Um, they decided to team up with Samuel Hannaford um, of Hannaford and Proctor, a very, very prominent architectural firm here in Cincinnati. They also did Music Hall. They did 800 Broadway. Uh, they did City Hall. Very, very prominent structures here. Um, so the first portion of the building was constructed in 1874. Um, the original building is all built of heavy, load-bearing masonry with and keep it coated. Spencer, it's my understanding that uh, this area is as we can and keep it coated. Spencer, it's my understanding that uh, this area of Cincinnati is absolutely infiltrated with tunnels. And uh, we, we understand there used to be a subway system or it was once uh, trying to be constructing a subway system and various other usages. So tell me a little bit about how this building ties in with some of those tunnels in the area. Yeah, I neglected to mention that uh, this side of the canal used to be uh, first and second generation German um, residences, but there were also a lot of beer halls. Uh, there's some over where the convention center is. I mean, the um, casino is located. Okay, guys, there was such a wealth of information in this history in your own backyard uh, video on the Alms and Depke building that I couldn't do it justice by just recording their video so I had to stop make notes and um, kind of deliver a script to present to you right so I'm gonna do that now okay so on the left this is seated uh, Spencer Johnson that's the name of a local architect I understand he's very important and he's been in, involved in in uh, renovations of the on Alms and Depke building uh, going as far back as 1998 and on the right you have seated uh, Scott Borders that's his name and he makes this series history in your own backyard so they get into talking and they say that basically the Alms and Depke building uh, started out as a dry goods merchant store and it was established well before 1855 these are the dates that they drop now this is a little bit murky as to the history because the Alms and Depke building itself wasn't uh, supposedly designed until 1868 so I can only go by the official story that they're saying which I don't believe I'll tell you that and they're saying that this particular Alms and Depke building uh, business the business was uh, going back as far as 1855 now I'm going to try to get to the image notes I left so I want to get to 1 minute and 14 so this is just a good uh, photo to show you and then I, I wrote a note to include the one at 123 as well okay um, there's a term used in Cincinnati and they mentioned it in this video where they call uh, this area of Cincinnati the over the Rhine district and I think that's a neat name obviously Cincinnati had a lot of German immigrants so this is probably a reference to the Rhine River in Germany right so this is kind of like colloquial language they used to describe the canal that went through the original uh, city right so that's probably what the over the Rhine district means I stand to be challenged on that but I'm pretty sure of what I'm saying then I had uh, notes to show you the image at 155 Okay, let's just and record it in. Class. So they decided to build. Right, pretty good image there. Okay, in their video, these guys go on to mention Hannaford and Proctor, and they are, and this this Hannaford and Proctor was originally an architectural firm in Cincinnati, and supposedly this Hannaford and Proctor, which I looked up separately you can see it here this was supposedly an architectural firm that built a lot of major important buildings in Cincinnati and they actually mentioned them in the video so I'm gonna backtrack a little bit and let it play into the video firm here in Cincinnati. They also did okay better take this adjust the speed I'll put the closed captioning on too so you can read that architectural firm here in Cincinnati they also did music hall oh. they did a very very prominent oh, architect that's right. to team up with Samuel Hannaford um, of Hannaford and Proctor a very very prominent architectural firm here in Cincinnati they also did Music Hall they did 800 Broadway uh, they did City Hall very very prominent structures here uh, okay well I can tell you that the same kind of uh, situation happens in the city I live in as well uh, supposedly there's like these old architects that divide 
that designed all the major buildings even in the city where I live. I don't live near Cincinnati, I live in southern Ontario, but in my own city the same situation goes on where you get like all these major old buildings and supposedly they're built by the same architects. If you watch Rebel Without a Pause and some of his videos on Glasgow, he has some similar ideas in some of his some of the buildings that he covers in Glasgow. He actually goes so far as to look into the history of the architecture. Okay, at 2 minutes and 29 seconds, uh, Spencer Johnson and, and Scott Borders end up discussing how the construction of the building only happens in 1874. So here we get the lineage of this story. Apparently the building was originally designed in 1868, then built in 1874. Here's a really great shot I wanted to get in to the video. This is um, in the 1930s, so here's the Alms and Depke building. They've already paved over the canal that went through the town. So in this history in your own backyard video, they go into kind of quick detail as to all the historical renovations that were done on this particular building. There was one in 1890 and 1906 by a Daniel Burnham and again in 1955 there was some kind of renovation. I thought this was kinda neat shows you what the building looks like today. Nice panoramic shot. Okay so according to Spencer Johnson's official story the uh, Alms and Depke business itself went out of business in 1955 so apparently that's when this building stopped, be, stopped being used as a dry goods store. Now what I'm coming up to is almost like uh, the peak or pinnacle of the thing I'm trying to say um, at 3 minutes and 47, 40 seconds they actually touch on the historical title to this property like who owned this originally and I'm getting excited folks here can you hear the excitement in my voice they're talking about who originally owned this and it's kind of murky as to whether the alms guys or the Depke William Depke even owned this and I'm gonna record this right into the video so here here they touch upon uh, title to this property here we go uh, there was some question about who the ownership of the building was at the time and then um, whoever became the owner at that time decided to try to renovate the building to use for office space and at that time Hamilton County came in and began to rent the space for municipal courts so the now I want to be clear you go back and watch the original video 1955 Alms and Depke go out of business and and the problem is they don't really know who owns the building well nobody owns it apparently who owns it? Well, apparently somebody does own it. And the story that Spencer Johnson goes on to tell is that like the, he kind of makes it sound like Hamilton County owns it, but he, no, they don't own it. He says that Hamilton County, for their municipal courts, rented this building out. They rented this. So who are they renting to? Now, Spencer Johnson is not saying who they're renting to, and he's not dropping the title, the name of the title of the people that own this building. So I want that to be very clear. Now, this is almost the entire point of the of the whole video I'm making, is that it's not clear as to who owns this historical building and we don't want to say their name and to further prove my point uh, apparently the county of Hamilton the Hamilton County which is in Ohio which I suppose is the county that Cincinnati is in apparently the county of Hamilton purchased this purchases this building in the 1990s further proof that this building did not even belong to the county itself just listen to this when the county decided to buy the building and do a complete renovation and at that time the entire building was gutted on the inside yeah so apparently somebody owned this and sold it back to the city this was just a good photo to sneak in okay so at four minutes and seven seconds into their video excuse me five minutes and seven seconds into the video they start talking about tunnels and not only tunnels um, under the city but actually tunnels that connect underneath to the Alms and Depth Key building itself. And I meant to get a good image. Um, well, this isn't the Alms and Depth Key building, but here you have a good picture of the canal. And as they explain in the video, under the ground there's all these beer halls. Beer halls, they say. This is at 5 minutes and 38 seconds. So who would go to the trouble to build an underground beer hall? 
folks, come on, this is an underground tunnel. This is mud flood. This is something else. This is like pre-existent. How do you build this underground? How did they tunnel? How did they have the tunneling technology back in the 1850s, 1860s? Now this was a really great money shot. This is in six minutes. This is at six minutes and 40 seconds. Here you have the canal of the street. And I don't know where the Oms and Depke building is. Maybe this is a different area. But check it out. You know what I think this looks like? I think there was a canal that was already here. And they didn't excavate the dirt. I think they dug out the mud from the existing canal. That's what I think this is. Okay, maybe I take that back. That last sen sentence didn't make a lot of sense. But anyway, here's a great shot of the canal. Check out uh, the original history in your own backyard video. I didn't want to just play it into my video because it's not my car.